All right, welcome back to a chapter 16. Here we go. The blade glanced off his body armor and sliced his left upper arm. As Coriolanus leaped backward, he swung at Bobbin, but only encountered air. He landed in a pile of debris, old boards, and plaster as his hands searched for some kind of defense. Defense. Bobbin sprang at him again, aiming the knife at his face. Coriolanus' fingers closed around a two-by-four, and he brought it up, catching Bobbin in the temple hard, sending him to his knees. And then he was on his feet, using the board like a club, bringing it down again and again, without being sure where it made contact. We have to go, Sejanus shouted. Coriolanus could hear catcalls now, and feet pounding down the bleachers. Confused, he made a move toward Marcus's body, but Sejanus yanked him away. No, leave him, run! Needing no persuasion, Coriolanus sprinted for the barricade. Pain shot from his elbow to his shoulder, but he ignored it, pumping his, pumping his arms as hard as he could, the way Professor Sickle had taught him. When he reached the barricade, barbed wire bit into his shirt. As he turned to pull it free, he saw them, the two just tributes from District 4, Coral and Mizzen, and Tanner, the slaughterhouse kid, making straight for him, armed to the teeth. Mizzen drew his arm back to throw a trident. The fabric on Coriolanus' sleeve ripped wide as he yanked it from the barbed wire and dove out of the line of fire, with Sejanus right behind him. Only a few weak rays of moonlight penetrated the layers of the barricade, and Coriolanus found himself crashing into wood and fencing like a wild bird in a cage, surely alerting any tribute who'd somehow missed his presence. He ran face first into a concrete slab, and Sejanus plowed into him from behind, smacking his forehead into the unrelenting surface a second time. When he pushed back, it was as if concussion had never left. His head throbbed and a cloud of confusion descended. The tribute stared up a whooping started up a whooping sound, rattling their weapons against the barricade as they tracked the mentors through the labyrinth. Which direction to go? The tribute seemed to be all around them. Sejanus grabbed his arm and began to pull him, and he stumbled blindly along behind, wounded and terrified. Was this it then? Was this how he died? The fury at the injustice of it all? The mockery it made of his existence sent a surge of energy through him, and he crashed past Sejanus, finding himself on his hands and knees in a cloud of soft red light. The passageway! Up ahead, he could make out the turnstiles where the peacekeepers were clustered at the temporary bars. He ran for his life. The passage wasn't long, but it seemed interminable. His legs rose and fell as if he were high, as if he were waist high in glue, and black specks dotted his vision. Sejanus stayed steady at his elbow, but he could hear the tributes gaining, something heavy and unyielding. A brick? Clipped the side of his neck. Another object punctured his vest and stuck, bobbing ahead, bobbing behind him until it fell with a clank. Where was the cover? The protective gunfire from the peacekeepers. There was nothing, nothing at all, and the bars still stood flush with the floor. He wanted to scream for them to kill the tributes, shoot them dead in their tracks, but his breath was in too short supply. Someone heavy-footed shrank his lead to a few yards, but once again, remembering Professor Sickle's training, he didn't dare, dare waste a second looking back to see who it was. Before him, the peacekeepers finally managed to tilt the unit of bars inward, achieving a gap of about 12 inches at the ground. Coriolanus dove, sanding several layers, sanding several layers of skin off his chin on the rough floor, just getting his hands beneath the bars, where the peacekeepers latched onto him and gave him a great yank. Lacking time to turn his head, the rest of his face scrapped scraped against the filthy surface until he reached safety. The guards dumped him immediately to retrieve Sejanus, who gave a sharp cry as Tanner's knife cut open the back of his calf before he slid out of range. Ugh. The bars were slammed into place and bolts locked down the unit, but the tributes were determined. Tanner, Mizzen, and Coral jabbed their weapons through the bars at Coriolanus and Sejanus, spewing hate-filled taunts while the peacekeepers banged on the turnstiles with their batons. Not a shot was fired, not even a shot of pepper spray. Coriolanus realized that they must have been under orders to leave the tributes untouched. 
As the peacekeepers helped him to his feet, he spat out in rage. Thanks for having our backs. Just following orders. Don't blame us if Gaul thinks you're expendable, boy, said the old peacekeeper who'd promised him cover. Someone tried to steady him, but he shoved them off. I can walk. I can walk. No thanks to you. Then he listed sideways, almost hitting the floor before they hoisted him up again and made their way back through the lobby. Coriolanus babbled a long string of profanities which made no impression and hung in the grip in their grip like dead weight until they dropped him, unceremoniously just outside the arena. After a minute, they deposited Sejanus beside him. They both lay panting on the tiles that graced the front of the arena. I'm so sorry, Corio, said Sejanus. I'm so sorry. Corio was a nickname for old friends, for family, for people Coriolanus loved. But this was the moment Sejanus decided to try it out. If he'd had the energy, Coriolanus would have reached over and strangled him. No one paid them any attention. Ma had vanished. Dr. Gall and Dean Highbottom debated audio levels as they watched the fe feeds in the van. van. The peacekeepers stood in loose clumps waiting for instructions. Five minutes passed before an ambulance drove up and popped up its back doors. The boys were loaded in without so much as a glance from the authorities. The medic gave Coriolanus a pad to hold against his arm wound while she dealt with the more pressing issue of Sejanus's calf, which was producing quite a bit of blood. Coriolanus dreaded returning to the hospital and that untrustworthy Dr. Wayne until he saw through the small pane of glass that they'd arrived at the Citadel, which seemed twice as scary. Unloaded onto gurneys, they were swiftly transported deep down to the lab where Clemencia had been attacked, leaving Coriolanus to wonder just what modifications they had in store for him. Accidents must have been frequent in the lab as a small medical clinic awaited them. It had lacked the sophistication for Clemencia's resurrection, yet seemed adequate to patch up the boys. A white curtain divided their two hospital beds, but Coriolanus could hear Sejanus giving one-word answers to the doctor's inquiries. He gave little more himself as they stitched his arm and cleaned his raw face. His head ached, but he didn't dare to tell them about the rebound of his concussion, for fear he'd end up being admitted to the hospital for an indefinite stay. All he wanted was to get away from these people. Despite his protests, they stuck an IV in his arm to rehydrate him and deliver some cocktail of drugs, and he lay rigid, rigid on the bed, willing himself not to flee. Although he'd done Dr. Gall's bidding, although he succeeded, he felt more vulnerable than ever, and here he lay, wounded and trapped, hidden away in her lair. The pain eased in his arm, but he did not feel the velvet curtain of morphling draw around him. Some alternative drug must have been administered, because if anything, his mind felt a heightened sharpness, and he noticed everything, from the weave of the bedsheet to the tug of the tape on his raw skin to the bitter taste the metal cup of water left on his tongue. Peacekeeper Boots approached and withdrew, taking a limping Sejanus with them. Deep in the lab, a round of squeals heralded some creature's feeding time, and the faint scent of fish re reached him. After that, a relative hush fell over, over the place for a long time. He considered trying to slip away, but knew in his heart he was expected to wait to wait for the soft, slipper tread that inevitably made its way to his cubicle. When Dr. Gall pulled him pulled back the curtain, the twilight of the nocturnal lab gave Coriolanus the strange impression that she stood on the edge of a cliff, that if he were to give her even the smallest shove, she would topple backward into some great chasm, never to be heard from again. If only, he thought, if only. Instead, she moved forward and placed two fingers on his wrist, checking his pulse. He flinched at the feel of her cool, papery fingers. I started out as a medical doctor, you know, she said. Obst obstetrix. Obstetrix. Hmm. Wasn't really for me, said Dr. Gall. Parents always want reassurances you can't give about the futures their children's face. How could I possibly know what they'd encounter? Like you tonight. Who would have imagined Crasis Snow's darling baby boy fighting for his life in the Capitol Arena? Not him, for one. Coriolanus didn't know how to respond. He could barely remember his father, let alone divine his meanings. What was it like in the arena? Dr. Gall asked. Terrifying, said Coriolanus flatly. 
It's designed to be. She checked his pupils, shining a light into each of his eyes. What about the tributes? The light hurt his head. What about them? Dr. Gall moved on to his stitches. What did you think of them, now that their chains have been removed? Now that they've tried to kill you? Because it was of no benefit to them, your death. You're not the competition. It was true. They'd been close enough to recognize him, but they'd hunted him. They'd hunted down him and Sejanus. Sejanus, who treated the tribute so well, fed them, defended them, given them last rights, even though they could have used that opportunity to kill one another. I think I underestimated how much they hate us, said Coriolanus. And when you realized that, what was your response? She asked. He thought back to Bobbin, to the escape, to the tribute's bloodlust, even after he'd cleared the bars. I wanted them dead. Wanted every one of them dead. Dr. Gall nodded. Well, mission accomplished with that little one from eight. You beat him to a pulp. Have to make up for some of that buffoon flickerman to tell ooh. Well, mission accomplished with that little one from eight. You beat him to a pulp. Have to make up some story for that buffoon flickerman to tell in the morning. But what a wonderful opportunity for you. Transformative. Was it? Coriolanus remembered the sickening thuds of his board against Bobbin. So he had what? Murdered the boy? No, not that. It was an open and shut case of self-defense. But what then? He had killed him, certainly. There would never be any erasing that. No regaining that innocence. He had taken human life. Wasn't it? More than I could have hoped. I needed you to get Sejanus out of that arena, of course, but I wanted you to taste that as well, she said. Even if it killed me, asked Coriolanus. Without the threat of death, it wouldn't have been much of a lesson, said Dr. Gall. What happened in that arena? That's humanity undressed. The tributes, and you too. How quickly civilization disappears. All your fine manners, education, family background, everything you pride yourself on, stripped away in the blink of an eye, revealing everything you actually are. A boy with a club who beats another boy to death. That's mankind in its natural state. The idea, laid out as such, shocked him, but he attempted a laugh. Are we really as bad as all that? I would say yes, absolutely, but it's a matter of personal opinion. Dr. Gall pulled a roll of gauze from the pocket of her lab coat. What do you think? I think I wouldn't have beaten anyone to death if death if you hadn't stuck me in that arena, he retorted. You can blame it on the circumstances, the environment, but you made the choices you made, no one else. It's a lot to take in all at once, but it's essential that you make an effort to answer that question. Who are human beings? Because who are we to determine the type of governing we need? Later on, I hope you can reflect and be honest with yourself about what you learned tonight. Dr. Gall began to wrap his wound in gauze and a few stitches in your arm is a cheap price to pay for it. Coriolanus felt nauseous at her words, but even more enraged that she had forced him to kill for the sake of her lesson. Something that significant should have been his decision, not hers. No one's but his. So if I'm a vicious animal, then who are you? You're the teacher who sent her student to beat another boy to death. Oh yes, that role has fallen to me. She neatly finished the bandage off, you know, Dean Highbottom and I read your essay through. What you liked about the war. A lot of fluff. Drivel, really. Until the bit in the end. The part about control. For your next assignment, I'd like you to elaborate on that. The value of control. On what happens without it. Take your time with it, but it might be nice. But it might be a nice addition to your prize application. Coriolanus knew what happened without control. He'd seen it recently. At the zoo when Arachne died, in the arena when the bombs went off, and then again tonight. Chaos happens. What else is there to say? Oh, a good deal, I think. Start with that. Chaos. No control. No law. No government at all. Like being in that arena. Where do we go from there? What sort of agreement is necessary if we're to live in peace? What sort of social contract is required for survival? She removed the drip from his arm. We'll need you back in a couple of days to check those stitches. Until then, I would keep the night's events to yourself. Better get home and catch a few hours of sleep. Remarkably, your tribute still needs you. 
After she left, Coriolanus slowly pulled on his sliced, torn, bloody shirt and fastened the buttons. He wandered until he found the elevator to street level, and the disinterested guards waved him out. The trolleys ended at midnight, and the capital clock showed two, so he pointed his filthy shoes toward home. The plinth's luxurious car slid up bes beside him, and the window lowered to reveal the Avox, who stepped out and opened the back door for him. Coriolanus guessed he'd already taken Sejanus home, and Ma had sent him back. Since the car was empty of the plinths, he got in. One last ride, then he wanted nothing to do with the family ever again. When the driver let him out at his apartment, Coriolanus was presented with a large paper bag. Before he could object, the car pulled away. Upstairs, he peeked, into, he peeked in to see Tigress waiting by the, ta by the tea table, wrapped in a ratty fur coat that had been her mother's. It was her security blanket much as the rose powder compact had been his before he revamped it as a weapon. He grabbed a school jacket from the coat rack and pulled it over his damaged shirt before he went in to see her. Coriolanus tried to make light of the dreadful night. Surely it's not so bad you need the coat. Her fingers, her fingers dug into the fur. You tell me. I will, every bit of it, but in the morning, okay? He said. Okay. When she reached up to hug him goodnight, her hand felt the bulge of the bandage on his arm. Before he could stop her, she pulled back the jacket and saw the blood. She bit her lip. Oh, Corio, they made you go into the arena, didn't they? He hugged her. Not that bad, really. I'm here. Got Sejanus out, too. Not that bad? It's horrific to think of you in there. To think of anyone in there, she cried. Poor Lucy Gray. Lucy Gray. Now that he'd been in that arena himself. Her circumstances seemed even more dire than before. The thought of her huddled somewhere in the cold blackness of that arena, too petrified to close her eyes, made him ache. For the first time, he felt glad he'd killed Bobbin. At least he'd save her from that animal. It's going to be okay, Tigress, but you have to let me get some rest. You need some sleep, too. She nodded, but he knew she'd be lucky to snatch an hour or two. He handed her the bag, courtesy of Ma Plinth, breakfast by the smell of it. See you then. See you then? Not bothering to bathe, he collapsed into a comatose sleep until the sound of the grand Mam singing the anthem woke him. Time to be getting up anyway. Aching head to toe, he teetered to the shower, removing the gauze from his arm and let the hot water scream over his scraped flesh. He had a tube of ointment from his time in the hospital and, although unsure of its use, dabbed it on his, on his raw face and chin. The stitches on his arms snagged on his clean shirt, but no new bleeding appeared. He'd wear his jacket today just in case. Throwing a toothbrush and fresh uniform in his book bag, he took one last look in the mirror and sighed. Bicycle accident, he thought. That's the story. Not that I've had a working bicycle in years. Well now... Well now he had an excuse for its broken condition. Once he was presentable, the first thing he did was check the television to make sure no harm had come to Lucy Gray, but the camera hadn't shifted, and the only tribute visible in the early morning light was Lamina on her beam. Avoiding the grand ma'am, he came into the kitchen where Tigress was warming up the leftover jasmine tea. Running late, he said, I better get going. Take this for breakfast. She put a packet in his hands and placed a pair of tokens in his pocket. And take the trolley today. Needing to conserve energy, he did as he was told, riding the trolley and eating two loaded egg and sausage rolls Mrs. Plinth had sent over. His only regret about ditching the Plinths would be the loss of her cooking. The main student body had been told to report at a quarter to eight, so the early birds consisted of the active mentors and a few Avoxes tidying the hall. Coriolanus couldn't help throwing a guilty look at Juno Phipps, who sat discussing her strategy with Domina. Domitia? Domitia? When she could have slept in. She didn't much like her. She, always, she was always throwing her family lineage in his face, as if his wasn't as good. But last night hadn't been fair to her either. He wondered just how they would reveal Bobbin's death and how he would feel when they did, besides Queasy. The only thing being served at Heavensby Hall was tea, which brought grumblings from Festus. If we have to be here early, you'd think they'd they could at least fed us. What happened to your face? Bike accident. 
Coriolana said loud enough for everyone to hear. He tossed the bag with the last roll to Festus, happy to be able to offer food for a change. He owed the creeds more meals than he cared to remember. Thanks, this looks great, said Festus, digging in immediately. Lysistrata recommended a cream to prevent infection, and they went ahead and took their seats as their schoolmates began to arrive. Although the sun had been up for a few hours, nothing much appeared to change on the screen except the disappearance of Marcus's body. I guess they removed it, said Pub. But Coriolanus thought it might still be by the barricade where he and Sejanus had abandoned it last night, just out of range of the shot. At the stroke of eight, they all rose for the anthem, which was which his classmates finally seemed to be getting a handle on, and then Lucky Flickerman appeared, welcoming them to day two of the Hunger Games. While you were sleeping, something pretty important happened. Let's take a look, shall we? They cut back to the wide shot of the arena, and then slowly panned the camera around to the barricade zooming in. As Coriolanus had suspected, Marcus's body lay there, lay where he and Sejanus had dropped it. A few feet away, Bobbin's battered, Bobbin's battered form slumped against a clunk of concrete. It looked much, much worse than he'd imagined. The bloody limbs, he dislo the dislodged eye, the face so swollen it was unrecognizable. Had he really done that to another boy? And such a young boy, too. For in death, Bobbin looked tinier than ever. Lost in that dark web of terror, it seemed he had. Perspiration beaded Coriolanus' forehead, and he wanted to leave the hall, the building, the entire event behind. But of course, that wasn't an option. Who was he? Sejanus? After a good long look at the bodies, the show cut back to Lucky as he pondered who might have done the deed. Then his mood changed abruptly. One thing we do know is that we've got something to celebrate. Confetti fell from the ceiling and Lucky blew madly away on a plastic horn. Because we've just hit the halfway mark. That's right. That's right. <laughs> twelve tributes down and only twelve to go. A string of brightly colored handkerchiefs shot out of his hand. He swung it around his head, dancing and cheering. Woo wee! When, when he finally wound down, he adopted a sad expression, but that also means we've got to say our, fel our farewells to Miss Juno Phipps. Lepidus? Lepidus had already positioned himself at the end of the unsuspecting Juno's aisle, and she had no choice but to join him and work through her disappointment on camera. Given a little notice, Coriolanus imagined she'd have compo composed herself more graciously, but as it was, she came off as sour and suspicious questioning the recent developments as she flashed a leather binder inlaid with the Phillips family crest. Something seems fishy to me, she told Lepidus. I mean, what's he doing over there with Marcus's body? Who moved it? And how did Bobbin end up dead? I can't even imagine a likely scenario. I feel like there might have been a foul play. The reporter sounded genuinely puzzled. What would qualify as foul play exactly? I mean, in the arena. Well, I don't know exactly, streamed Juno. But I, for one, would really like to see a replay of last night's events. Good luck with that, Juno, thought Coriolanus. Then he realized it did exist, in the back of the van. Dr. Gall and Dean Highbottom had been watching both versions, the real feed and the one they'd darkened to obscure his mission. Even the regular one would have, seen, would have been hard to make out. Still, he didn't like it, the idea that somewhere there was a, re a record, however shadowy of him killing Bobbin. If it were to ever get out, well, he didn't know what, but it made him uneasy. Lepidus didn't dally with Juno, a sore loser who lacked Felix's grace and defeat, and she was directed back to her seat with the consoling pat on the back. Still sparkly with confetti, Lucky seemed oblivious to her pain. He leaned in toward the camera with barely contained glee, and... And now, what do you suppose? We've got an extra big surprise, especially if you're one of the twelve remaining mentors. Coriolanus only had a moment to exchange questioning looks with his friends before Lucky bounded across the studio to reveal Sejanus sitting side by side with his father, Straboplinth, whose stern expression seemed carved by the very granite of his home district. Lucky took the host chair and patted Sejanus on the leg. Sejanus, I'm sorry we didn't get a moment with you yesterday to let you comment on the demise of your tribute, Marcus. Sejanus just stared at Lucky uncomprehendingly. Lucky seemed to notice the abrasions on his face for the first time. What's going on here? You look like you've been mixing it up yourself. I fell off my bike, Sejanus rasped. 
and Coriolanus winced slightly. Two biking mips, mixhap, mishaps in the same 12-hour period seemed more than coincidental. Ouch. Well, I guess you have some pretty big news to share with us, Lucky said with an encouraging nod. Sejanus lowered his eyes for a moment, and while neither father nor son acknowledged each other, a battle seemed to be occurring. Yes, Sejanus finally began. We, the Plinth family, would like to announce that we will be giving a prize for a full ride to the university, to the mentor whose tribute wins the Hunger Games. Pup let out, let out a whoop, and the other mentors grinned at one another. Coriolanus knew most of them didn't need the money as badly as he did, if at all, but it would be a feather in anyone's in anyone's cap. Sensational, said Lucky. What a thrill those twelve remaining mentors must be experiencing right now. Was this your idea, Strabo, to create the Plinth Prize? My sons, actually, said Strabo, curving the edges of his lips up in what Coriolanus thought might be an attempt at a smile. Well, what a generous and appropriate gesture, especially given Sejanus's defeat. You may not have won the games, but you've certainly taken home the prize for good sportsmanship. I think I speak for the capital when I say many thanks. Lucky beamed at the pair, but as nothing else was forthcoming, he made a sweeping gesture with his arm. All right then, back to the arena. Coriolanus's mind reeled with the new development. Sejanus had been right about his father's hasty attempt to bury his son's outrageous behavior in cash. Not that it didn't merit damage control. He hadn't heard much reaction from others in Heavensby Hall about the outburst of the chair, but he expected stories were going around. A prize for the victor's mentor seemed a small price to pay, really. What would Plinth offer to prevent word of Sejanus' trip into the arena from going public? Could he be planning to buy Coriolanus' silence? Never mind, never mind that, Coriolanus told himself. The bigger news was that possibly was the possibility of winning the Plinth prize. It was independent of the academy, so Dean Highbottom wouldn't have a say in it. Even Dr. Gall would not. A full ride, that would free him from their power and lift this awful anxiety about the future from his shoulders. Already high, the stakes of these games shot into the stratosphere. Focus, he told himself, drawing slow, deep breaths. Focus on helping Lucy Gray. What was, what was there to do, though, until, he sh until she showed her face? As the morning passed, it seemed few of the tributes were tempted to do so. Coral and Mizzen roamed around together for a bit, collecting food and water from Festus and Persephone, their mentors. They'd been spending time together trying to come up with a joint strategy for their tributes, and Coriolanus could see that Festus was falling for her. Did you tell your best friend his crush was a cannibal? Never a rule. Never a rule book when you needed one. When they returned to the Diaz after lunch, they found the mentor's seats had been reduced to 12, leaving only enough space for those with tributes still in the games. The game makers requested it, Satirius told the final dozen. It makes it easier for the audience to keep track of who's still a contender. We're to keep removing seats as your tributes are killed, like musical chairs, said Dementia with a pleased look. But with people dying, said Lysistrata. The decision to bump the losers from the Diaz met Livia even more bitter if that was possible, and Coriolanus was glad to see her relegated to the regular audience section, where he wouldn't have to hear her snarky comments. On the other hand, it made it harder to put distance between himself and Clemencia, who seemed to spend all her free time glaring at him. He positioned himself in the last row, bolstered by Festus and Lysistrata, and tried to look engaged. As the afternoon unrolled, his head got heavier and heavier until Lysistrata had to nudge him twice to keep him awake. Perhaps it was fortunate the day required so little of him, given that the night had almost killed him. There were few tribute sightings and Lucy Gray stayed completely hidden. Not until the late afternoon did the Hunger Games finally begin, finally present the kind of action that people expected. The girl tribute from District 5, five a rickety little thing, who had been one of the unwashed herd to Coriolanus, made her way out onto the bleachers at the far end of the arena. Failing to find her name, Lucky just managed to connect her with the, her equally forgettable mentor, Iphigenia Moss, whose father oversaw the agriculture department and thus the flow of food around Penem. Contrary to expectations, Iphigenia always seemed on the verge of malnutrition, often giving her school lunch to her classmates and even blacking out on occasion. 
Clemencia had once told Coriolanus it was the only revenge she could take on her father, but refused to give any more details. True to form, Iphigenia began to unload every bit of food she could on her tribute, but even as the drones made the long trek across the arena, Mezen, Coral, and Tanner, who appeared to have formed some sort of pack after the previous night's adventure, materialized from the tunnels and began their hunt. After a brief chase along the bleachers, the trio surrounded the girl and Coral killed her with a trident to the throat. Well, that's that, said Lucky, still unable to locate the tribute's name. What can her mentor tell us, Lepidus? Iphigenia had already sought out Lepidus. Her name was Sol, or maybe Sal. She had a funny accent, not much more to tell. Lepidus seemed inclined to agree. Nice job getting her to the second half, Albina. Iphigenia, said Iphigenia over her shoulder as she walked off the dais. That's right, said Lep Lepidus, and this means there's only eleven tributes left, which means ten between me and that prize, thought Coriolanus as he watched an Avox remove Iphigenia's chair. <clears throat> he wished he could get food and water to Lucy Gray. What would happen if he sent it in without knowing her location. On screen, the pack collected Sol or Sal's food and moved back toward the tunnels, probably to get some rest before the night came. Should he risk it now? He discussed it in whispers with Lysistrata, who felt that it might be worth a try if they sent in drones together. We don't want them getting too weak or dehydrated. I don't think Jessup's gotten anything in days. Let's wait and see if they try and contact us. Let's give them another... Let's give them until the supper break. But Lucy Gray made an entrance just as the student body was being released to go home. She darted out of a tunnel, running at full pitch, her hair loosening from her braids and flying free behind her. Where's Jessup? said Lysistrata with a frown. Why aren't they together? Before Coriolanus could venture a guess, Jessup staggered out of the same tunnel Lucy Gray had fled from. At first, Coriolanus thought he had been wounded, possibly while defending Lucy Gray. But then, what had accounted f But then... What accounted for her flight? Were other tributes in pursuit? As the camera moved in on Jessup, it's become apparent that he was ill, not hurt. Stiff-limbed and feverish with excitement, he swiped at the sun a few times before crouching down and springing almost immediately back to his feet for his first close-up. Coriolanus wondered if Lucy Gray had found a way to poison him, but that didn't make sense. Jessup was too valuable as a prospect, or as a protector especially with the pack that had formed last night running around. What then ailed him? Any number of things could have sickened him. Any range of maladies been suspected, if it hadn't been for the telltale foam that began to bubble over his lips. Ooh. All right, that's the end of chapter 16. Thank you so much, and I will see you later.